Party people, how's it hanging? Your boy BQ, this is your Impact Lounge Impact Wrestling Review, TNA Impact Wrestling Review. This is the Champions Challenge episode, highlighted by the Champions Challenge, which was much better than I thought it was going to be. So um, stay tuned for my thoughts on that. Much better than I thought it was going to be. This is the number one place to be. It still is. Don't get it twisted if you're a TNA wrestling fan. So hit that subscribe button, like, give me the comments, all that good stuff, man. Even get a wild hair up your ass and hit the bell for notifications. So happy happy Sunday morning to you guys. Uh, tonight is the night of double or nothing and people had asked if i planned on going to this since it was here in las vegas and uh i learned my lesson from that last collision show i went to and i had a really long day yesterday for events i actually care about uh, i went to my second uh las vegas aces game of the season um wnba during the day that started at noon and then in the evening we have a uh Triple A baseball team out here for the A's, uh, called the Aviators. Did that in the evening, you know. So uh, I enjoy doing that kind of stuff more than going to a six-hour wrestling show full of near falls and this is awesome. And um, and I'm not throwing TNA in that category. I'm, I'm uh, specifically talking about AEW. But trust me, I was tempted. I was like, it's here. Why not? Uh, but but I said, you know what? Nah. I don't got the energy for all that. I truly learned my lesson going to that collision ring of honor episode. And and it's going to take a while for me to go one, go back to one of their shows, even if I don't have to pay for the tickets. So, um, that is that, but, uh, we're not talking AEW. We're going to talk TNA here and this latest episode, which, uh, was, wasn't my favorite episode of the, of the year had, had some, from a storytelling standpoint, it had some redeeming qualities, but uh, and, and as I said, the main event, I didn't, I, I didn't dislike it. You know, when they announced it, I was like, "What is this shit show?" You know, that was the first thing when I saw the graphic. Um, but no, it wasn't that bad. It wasn't bad at all, actually. Uh, so I was, I was pretty, pretty happy with it. This is the most negative show on the channel, if you haven't figured it out by now. Did I say the most negative show on the channel? It's the most negative channel on the earth, on the planet earth, in all of YouTube land. I can uh, I can praise TNA all day and and no one, it feels like no one on Twitter will, uh, will pay attention to that. But I say one bad thing. As a matter of fact, I tweeted um, that after four years, the show finally looks good. I mean, am I wrong? I am. I pointed the shit out regarding the production value. Of course, I did every single podcast that I did. I even acknowledged, I've always acknowledged that I say it all the time because it's that important to me. And I think it's that important to the growth of the product. And um, it finally looks good. They finally stopped messing with it in, in post production. Like they're learning now that less is more. You do have to mess with the colors in post production, but it's, it, I mean, it's fucking minor. It's so, it's so minor. I can't even, I wish I could just pull up like settings for you guys and show you the sliders of how little you truly have to move things uh, to make it look better. You know what I'm saying? So, but yeah, I said it, I said it finally looks good. And then, you know, of course, I don't even remember this dude's name, man. This J Brown. Um, I retweeted it, but he's like, oh, well, don't watch it if you don't. I'm so sick of that response. Don't watch it if you don't like it. Have I ever said this isn't my favorite promotion or that I don't like TNA? I I list all these issues I have with the company because I fucking care. I don't, I don't know how that – that is the difference between someone who just, you know – wants to see a company grow and one who's just a wrestling mark who just thinks it's everything's great and that everything is growing yeah everything's fucking stellar right now the numbers are through the fucking roof i mean my show i say this i've been saying this a lot for the last couple months like my show is not for the wrestling marks it's for the tna fans the wrestling fans 
but who can also, you know, who who are watching a product that they like, but but can also look at it and be like, well, yeah, well, this isn't good. I can pick out this, this, and this that isn't good. This has to be better. This has to improve. This has to change if we want the company to grow. Because the company is not, you look, look at the ratings, you look at things of that nature, like it's not like through the roof. Attendance is better. Buzz is better. So there are there is some some elements of growth. But they're nowhere near where they need to be if they want to be a real player in this game, you know, and there's nothing wrong with pointing out those things. That does not mean you are not a fan. It, it, it doesn't mean, oh, well, then I should just stop watching. Like. If it was bad, if it was really bad at the end of the day, I would turn it off like I've turned off AEW. I watch a few highlights here and there. I listen to reviews. Um Stopped watching WWE a long time ago. I actually watched SmackDown the other day. My wife was watching it at work. With, uh, they had it on, so I was like, "I'll watch it with you." Why the fuck not? You know, um, I'm starting to come around on them a little bit right now. But I will turn off a wrestling show if I don't like it. I've I, I did say that back in 2020, I was really close to being done, uh, but I powered through it. Other than that, I've never got on here like, "Yo, fuck this show, fuck this company." I've always said this is my favorite company. I care that much to point out the things that need to be better. You know, you do, you're doing them no service. You're like, oh, everything's fucking wonderful. This shit's great. For me to point out that after four years, the show finally looks good. And then you respond, well, if you don't like it, don't watch. Like, I'm so fucking sick of that response. That That is the response of someone who does not watch real sports. Because if you watch real sports, we'll take my WNBA NBA fever right now. They've got blown out the, the all three fucking games they've been on the court this year. I'm not sitting here in the in my Facebook groups that I'm with and like, well, they were they did this and this and this was really good. I'm like, we fucking suck, man. You know what I'm saying? Like LA Angels last fucking place, dude. I turned I watched the game the other day and they were down six nothing within four innings. And I'm like, we've I was like, this is the worst franchise in baseball. Don't get me started on the fucking Clippers. That you can be frustrated and watch something you like. You know, there of course there's a breaking point where you're gonna say, I can't do this anymore. There's always a breaking point. But someone who who actually watches real fucking sports knows, you know, there's there's just peaks and valleys. And that's that's part of the fandom. Now it gets old after a while if they don't if the necessary changes aren't made. You know what I'm saying? Um, who was this fucking guy that said this on Twitter, man? Like, usually I don't respond to this kind of crap. Who is this dude? But I mean, I mean, I've been calling people out lately, so I don't really give a shit. Ultimate Sky Daddy, U.S. Sky Daddy. Get out of here. Fucking wrestling marks. Go, dude, pick a football team. Like, don't get me started about the Chargers. You know what I'm saying? Like, pick a football team. Um, watch real sports and just realize it's not all fucking rainbows. If your team goes on a four-game losing streak, five-game, six-game losing streak, you don't sit here and point out the fucking positives. You, you say, this team fucking sucks right now. That's what real fucking fans do let's get into this folks this starts with, with ash by elegance versus queen of the rubber match zaya brookside and this is over the bejeweled knuckles so this is why i was saying that this wasn't my favorite episode in the world there are some redeeming qualities as there usually are from week to week but when you start off with ash who I'm not off the train yet. I've said that many times. But people are starting to be out on her because we're not really getting good matches. And now she's going the the, the direction of bad comedy, which I don't think if you're if you're truly trying to build this person to to wrestle Jordan Grace one day, uh, I don't think that's a direction you want to go. But the last, I will say, like two to three weeks, they're re- very much going the direction of bad comedy like you can you can everyone doesn't have to be fucking serious but you can um incorporate a level of comedy into wrestlers without it being bad 
when I say bad comedy, it's because most people on this planet are not comedians, right? It takes a special person to be a stand-up uh, comedian. It takes a, a special person to be, you know, uh, Adam Sandler. It takes, you know, to be to be an actor who does, you know, Jim Carrey or whatever. I'm dating myself there, but you understand what I'm saying? Like, it takes a very special person. You cannot take Sylvester Stallone and someone thought it was Sylvester Stallone the other day. I pulled into fucking Del Taco. I mean, it, it, I'm not saying he like got his friends, but he he actually he did get one person and then he turned around and saw that I wasn't him. If you saw me in real life, you would see the the weird comparison between the two of us. <laughs> I get it a lot, actually, but more of a joke. This was the first time someone actually for a second as I pulled up thought I was him. Get the fuck out of here, number one. Number two, you can't put Sylvester Stallone in the role of um I'm trying to think of a comedian. Oh my god. Let's just just use stand-up comedy. You can't put Sylvester Stallone on the stage with Cat Williams act. Right? It takes a special person to be funny, to be genuinely funny. And wrestling hasn't grasped that. Wrestling is trying to make unfunny people funny and you just can't i think we all have a little bit of humor in us even the most boring dry person on the planet has some humor in them but you have to tap into that um and you can use that sparingly but when when it's when you're constantly like the young bucks for instance are two very unfunny people kenny omega is a very unfunny person i'm using AEW examples here because those are the most glaring to me because that's another company that uses a lot of bad comedy. They're very unfunny people, but they, they over the years did a lot of segments where they were trying to be funny and they're, they're just not. So you have to embrace that you're not. And right now with, with the Ash character, I'm seeing an infusion of too much comedy to where I don't think it's working. I, I think Iceman can do, he has some of it in him. You can tell. I don't know that Ash does, but they just have to be very careful because if this is the person that you're going to anoint as the successor, I still truly feel that to Jordan Grace at some point this year, um, you can't go that direction, especially if she you know, potentially leaves, which I think is, is a very real possibility. I guess anything is possible, but let's be fucking real. Uh, you, you just, you got to start now. You know what I'm saying? You have to like prepare. Maybe she comes back. Maybe she resigns. Maybe she retires. No one ever has besides Gail Kim, but maybe she does of all the fucking knockouts uh, in, in the world. But if she doesn't, you have to prepare for that eventual departure and doing the garlic cloves, wrestling over bejeweled knuckles. Like that's not getting you there. You feel me? So, um, Matt, also Matt Raywall starting to get very corny on commentary when he first kind of joined the company. Like I thought he was doing a pretty decent job. He's starting to get kind of corny for me. I did laugh at this point though. When, when I'm talking about, you can put a little comedy in it. When Iceman tried to remove his shirt with, and he had the referee shirt underneath. I thought that was funny because it didn't like, it was, it was, it was almost like, adding dry humor into the match because it was unnecessary. It was just like, Hey, I'm going to ref. It's like, no. And then she kicks him out or he or she, I don't remember who the ref was. <laughs> and then, and then that was it, you know? So that actually, that actually made me laugh. It took 10 seconds into this match, 10 for, for Tom Hannafin twice to say, and I kick out and I kick out. Um, this was just, this, this, just wasn't good. And I, and I like Zaya Brookside very, very much. I really think, I mean, this was better than their first match, but I really think she can be like such a massive baby face. She is tiny. I've met her in person twice and she, as small as she looks on TV, she is much fucking smaller in person. I am of average height. I'm five, nine. I am like Steph Delander's height. And I say that because, I believe PCO is an inch shorter than me. 
and on the episode here and they were looking face to face the, the lander looked like she was about his height or a little taller so like steph delander looks huge on tv right which she's tall for a girl but everyone looks so much bigger on tv than they actually are for those of you who've like really gotten out and meet wrestlers and all that you you know what i'm talking about but zaya brookside is very very tiny but i just didn't think this was a good way to start the show off the the announcer announcers were arguing at one point over who which between Zaya Brookside and Ash got to TNA first. Um, you know, Ash wins the match. And then she's asking for the, the knuckles from Zaya Brookside. And then Zaya Brookside falcon punches or just lays her out. Ash took an incredible bump here. But this is this is what I'm saying where it's getting a little too much with the comedy, you know, where the personal concierge is trying to fan her off and it there's already too much comedy that got up to that point excuse me and then that part comes off kind of goofy even though as i said ash really sold that bump great i thought that was a a good moment um and it, you know and it, and it has it so zaya is not leaving weak but at the same time i want to see heels get heat conan points this out about um AEW, and i never really thought about this because i don't care as much watching that show but he said the heel never leaves with heat like they'll do a beat down after the match and then some baby face runs down with a chair and scares them off and like no one no one leaves with heat and that happens nine out of ten times and that's kind of what happened here you know like zaya takes the losses but then she has to get some kind of comeuppance at the end they did a rosemary package here excellent it seems like, she, you know, I hope they didn't write Havoc off TV. I don't think so. Based on Havoc's tweet, you know, kind of feeding into the storyline. I don't think she's, like, written out of the company. And that would make no sense with Sammy just returning. But they look like, it looks like, jo uh, excuse me, Jordan, uh, Rosemary's possibly going heel here. This was the darkest stuff she has done since the initial, the, or excuse me, the inception of Decay. And we've seen different phases and stages of Rosemary. And there's been times where she's gone into very bad comedy and, 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 and just doing various things of comedy, like when she was with Taya Valkyrie. There was a short period of time where her and Taya were a, a heel tag team when they were trying to put the heel, I mean, the knockouts tag team div division together. And it was before they started getting silly after that, but the, you know, they started off silly and then they got kind of serious together and then they got silly again. But there was a point in there where Rosemary was a full fledged heel and it was a breath of fresh air and it was working. And then, you know, Ty left the company and then they go back to, I think they put her in decay and then she became a baby face again. They did the Courtney rush thing, which was okay because it's different. I'm always down for something different. That didn't last long. And then they, you know, became Decay again. And Decay has been, I pointed this out with the Knockouts Tag Team Championships. You can go on Wikipedia, look out, look up the Knockouts Tag Team Champions. They list them all in a row. And every single time that the Decay or uh, Rosemary, because I'll throw her and Taya in there, have become champions, it's because they're they're transitional champions they've been every single time it's because someone is leaving the company someone's injured or something like that they have never just won the titles and got a legit run they have been break cla break glass in case of emergency every single fucking time so the money with rosemary because rosemary speaking of money is is one of the few wrestlers in this world the delusionals will tell you otherwise she's one of the um and that's why I'm delusional BQ here in my just just as a just as a rib. The delusionals will tell you otherwise. The real wrestling fans will tell you that most wrestling fans want to get paid in this fucking industry. Every wrestler, James Storm said this in a in an interview. He goes, every wrestler joins a, becomes a wrestler to join a WWE. It, it, I know plans change along the way. Everybody joins to, to join to uh, becomes a wrestler to wrestle in the wwe one day 
Rosemary is one of the few that loves being in this role, loves being in a smaller company. She has said, I'm not motivated by money because I, I she, she said something like money that I cannot possibly spend. You know, as long as she's taken care of, essentially is what she's saying. Like, she's good. And character means a lot more to her. I've said it many times. The Rosemary character could not have worked on WWE. It can't work in... Uh, Sue Young could not work in WWE. Um, AEW kind of made the Amazon, uh, Amazon Amadon character work for a little bit. But it's... These are characters that work in small arenas. So Rosemary is one of those few people in wrestling that like, she's not going anywhere. She's probably going to stay with this company forever. So she may be, she'll, she'll probably be the next knockout to retire. I know I made that comment earlier. She, she'll probably be uh, the one. If there's anyone on this roster, it's like, Hey, when I'm done wrestling, my last match will be for TNA. So with that being said, the best use of Rosemary is when she is that darker character because that's when she's been the most over like she's still over she's always going to be over but when she uh when she was kind of the darker character in decay that's when it's like yo this chick is fucking badass you know like we're not saying that about her now when she comes out we're not like oh rosemary's badass like rosemary's rosemary and we like rosemary i think it's impossible not to but uh this looked like they were going they're going back to a darker direct in a darker direction with her and um that can be very interesting. And if they can find a way to get her heel again, like she's never going to have total heat. It's very, she's very difficult to boo, but you know, um, I would have said Frankie Kazarian was difficult to boo and they've made that work. You know what I'm saying? So um, I'm very interested in this. This is really well done. The people who do these video packages are not the people that edit the show. Like it is so crystal freaking clear. Then we get Santino after something so good. And then we get Santino with Kushida. And he's checking on Kushida. And um, at first I said, thank God Kushida speaks English. That was my first. I was like, oh, he's, he speaks some broken English. And then I realized by the end of the segment, when he, was, when he said, no problem, that he just knows some English words for the, the sake of the fucking segments. I've been to, I've been, I would say probably deployed to six or seven different countries. So I've been around a lot of people who don't speak English. And then I've, I've stopped in certain countries like Japan for, you know, 24, 48 hours, whatever. When you hear that, that phrase, no problem. That is a, that is a common phrase for someone who doesn't speak English. I know that's not like, uh, I know people who do speak English use that phrase as well, but when it is a go-to phrase, I guess that's a better way of putting it. When you hear them use it more than the average, like English speaking American will, that's a, that's an easy phrase for them, for someone who doesn't speak English to say. Um, it, it's just like saying, it's just like giving a thumbs up, you know what I mean? They speak, no, no problem. Uh, that means they don't speak English. So, um, but at least they're trying to utilize him in a way so he... <laughs> He's using a little bit of English because now these guys are gone and Motor City Machine Guns. Kevin Knight seems to be gone already. And you signed this dude. So, you know, I thought that was good use of him. It doesn't mean I thought the segment was particularly good because Santino is now saying, you know, how are you feeling? Oh, well, when I was around you or whatever, my stomach. They're, they're doing this Jonathan Gresham thing that is not good. And the Jonathan Gresham character on the surface, looks great um, if he just came down with a with that mask and a mean streak i'd be like yo this, this character's fucking badass but once they started papa shangoing it up that's where they're losing me and that's where i think they're losing a lot of people it's still early and maybe maybe a month from now we're like yo this is a pretty badass character but right now um it's not working not for me, not working for me. Um, but I'm delusional, so it, it might be the greatest character in the history of TNA. Then we get Alan Angels versus Leon Slater. You know, I, I meant to mention this when they debuted Leon Slater. He looks a lot like Kevin Knight as far as... Kevin Knight's a little bigger 
muscle, more, a little more muscular. But when they debuted him, I was thinking, man, they shouldn't have put Kevin Knight in this match because I, you almost couldn't tell who was who throughout the course of the match because they're kind of the same stature, same height, wrestle very similarly. He is. I didn't know this kid was 19. You know, you know when they, they talk about Nick Wayne being some kind of like wrestling prodigy, like, yo, Nick Wayne got nothing on this dude. This fucking Swanton 450 that he does almost looks like a video game movie. It almost looks impossible. It does. Like you have you watching and be like, how can a human being do that move? A 450 is almost impossible. To like Swanton it up and then 450, like how how is that fucking humanly possible? That should be that move should be uh, all over fucking Twitter. Like that should be going viral. That is one of the most impressive things. And I've been saying, where's the cool finishers in TNA? Like that, that's one of them right there. This dude, um, I, just because I'm not familiar with the independent scene like that or the UK scene or whatever the hell, like a lot of people are, I would, I, I had to kind of take people's word for it when I said, yo, this is a major uh, blue chipper, you know, like as far as the signing goes, you know, I had to take people's credit, uh, take, people's word for it and give them you know and I'm, i give them credit because some people um some people will get on twitter and say oh this this dude is a you know a game changer or whatever and they come out they're no different than anybody else like this this kid is special but i thought the match was really random i was like okay why are we getting alan angels versus leon slater and then we figure out why within a few minutes and I'm surprised they actually went through with the match because normally they wouldn't in this kind of scenario. But within a few minutes, the ref is fake selling. Um, Tom is showing fake concern for the ref, who's nameless. Um, and then, you know, the referees come out. No medical staff. Just, you know, Frank the Goof and the other refs come running out with black gloves. Um, but, but there's no one to properly evaluate him. And then uh, one of the other, re- then Frank the Goof takes off his gloves and goes on the ring and um, takes over the match. So I was surprised that they continued it because usually when you have these random matches and then they throw in some angle into it, they find a way to make it a no contest. I give them a big thumbs up for continuing the match. But after he hit the the Swanton 450 and he won the match, um, he got up and he grabbed his neck briefly. When his arm was up, so he's probably next to get um, to get sick. And then everyone's favorite wrestler, uh, next generation Khan, comes out and he uh, confronts Alan Angel, snaps the neck. Nobody cares. I mean, there was no reaction to this. And you know why there was no reaction to this? Because the fucking angle happened in a backstage segment that these people didn't watch. This was just random to them. So, um, breaks the neck. And then, uh, I think he, they're trying to heat Khan up again. And I said, you can't, you can't heat that kind of character up. I've been saying that for about two months now. You got one shot at this, but because they had to put PCO over, he's dead. He's done. He should join his partner in NWA. His partner is undefeated there, by the way. He wrestles under a mask uh, under, by the name of Zion, but um, his old Ascension partner is there, and he's undefeated, and he's a number one contender for the national championship. Khan would be great there. Um, his uh, Victor, his old partner, said that they were in talks with NWA actually one point, and it just didn't materialize, but um, he would be great there. And again, I'll keep saying this. I don't dislike Khan. I hold on to my NXT fandom of his. But just this way of of they think they can like start stop this dude, it's it's just not going to work. Like I said, he came out, um, didn't work. I think he tried to snap Leon Slater's neck, but I think the security guards came down. Excuse me one second. (coughs) And then he snapped the neck. Let me swig a coffee real quick. Mike Gilbert style. Yeah. Look like the most contradictory fan in the world. My Clipper had my, my Indiana Pacers mug. 
So I got this. If I go to a wrestling, I mean a wrestling, a basketball event on a say I go to sometimes I'll travel to watch the Clippers in other arenas, but I always grab like a coffee mug as a as a uh, souvenir. But I also like the Pacers because when I lived in Illinois, they were pretty close to me and I would go watch their game sometimes. So I do got love for the Pacers. But anyway, um, those of you non wrestling fans like the dude I tweet that tweeted at me don't know what I'm talking about. Um, but yeah, then then the wrestling, uh, the uh, wrestler, independent wrestling security guard gets his next snap icon and it was done so fucking poorly. The camera was right on it. And it was just like, I, I mean, Khan does a pretty good job of that move, but this one was a miss. Maybe you guys didn't even catch it, but it was, it was like so poorly done. It, it's like he barely held him and he did it. I, it just. So then we get La- Gabby Laspisa again. She was part of a very bad segment last week with Ash by Elegance. She wasn't that bad this time here, and I don't even know if she was bad, but she, it's just the whole thing. The whole thing last week was just bad because, like I said, Ash, they're going uh, the the route of bad comedy with her. Um, then Naked Jake comes out, aka Jake put on something, anything, aka Jake let me slip into something more comfortable. He comes out. Um, and we finally get a meaning to his name. And they, they shit, she actually tied it into interviewing Ash the week before. Because they asked her about her name or uh, about the concierge name. She asked, um, you know, Jake, what is something? And we think as wrestling fans, it's just uh, Jake something. Like, like you would call someone who you can't pronounce his last name. He's, Jake, Jake something. I actually heard that at my job the other day. Someone said Jake something. And it said because it goes back to people saying he wouldn't be anything. And he's something. I have always hated this backstory in pro wrestling. And, and in sports in general, too. If you watch like the NBA draft, there's always someone you know that says... Everyone doubted me. Everyone said I'd become nothing. Think of what that scenario really looks like. The people who would say, yo, you ain't shit. You ain't nothing. You ain't never going to be nothing. Those are the probably the negative people in your life. And I've had negative people in my life. I don't feel the need to prove them wrong. I don't I don't feel the need to prove that I'm that I've become something. I could give two shits about those people. And then the people in your life who are the good people are probably not going to tell you, "Hey, you're never going to be anything." So to me it's a stupid backstory because it means you care too much about what people think of you. That's just my own personal take on that. It it just I don't even mean it in wrestling. Like I said, every every NBA draft, there's someone like no one no one believed in me. I had to prove them wrong. I've had people not believe in me in life. Trust me, like in the military, I've worked for people that did not believe in me. I just take care of business. I do what's best for me, best for my family. I go, they can go fuck themselves. Like, don't care what they think about me. You know what I'm saying? I've never felt the need to prove anybody wrong about what I've accomplished in life. But anyway, that's me on a high horse and, and probably looking way too much into this. But I'm just um, I'm just saying it, it's a backstory I can't fucking stand. But at least we get one. At least we know why he's Jake something, because he's become something. Finally. You know? Now him being, you know, this whole, now that he's like, they brought him out and then, you know, Cody Diener comes out. Now this whole fucking story of him being a loser makes sense i say loser i mean like who does who's the guy beat he's won a couple six-way x division matches but then when it comes to a real match a real opponent he doesn't win and i've been talking the last month now about him coming out half naked all the time about him having a bland entrance and being a caveman and everything being bland about this guy i just did a upload on the channel last week called jake nothing because kind of what he's been 
You know, maybe I'm one of those negative people in his life that he needs to prove wrong. But he's been nothing. He's the most start and stop guy they've got on the roster. So now we're getting something. We're getting some personality. Like he's talking. He's he's not really cutting a promo, but he's he's talking and it sounds good. It sounds natural. You know, it's so much better than him walking around yelling loud noises at people backstage. Um, so this this works. But Cody Diener comes out and um said he hasn't had a chance to apologize to him after all this after all this time for what happened with Violent by Design. And he said, Hey, we're cousins, you always be a Diener. He said, The hell I will, and he clotheslines him. And Gabby Lispiza stands there totally unfazed by this by what happened, what she just saw. I don't know if she's going to become like a valet or something. I doubt it because she's like a podcaster. I don't think they're. I mentioned to you guys that they're just doing more to get public figures on the show. Uh, and, and I think that's kind of where she is. She falls into that. You know, I don't think she's going to be like part of the show. But in a bad acting kind of way, I can see where it's like, oh, well, she was she was trying to egg on jake and egg you know do start this whole thing and she's going to be on jake's side i can see that in a very like bad acting uh, spear but she just stood there completely unfazed like like oh two wrestlers are fighting it's, she wasn't like oh you know nothing it wasn't fake selling nothing but now i'm interested in 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 this but is jake going to be the same coming out with the something tights uh, half naked walking around backstage is it, or, or is, is that this is their opportunity now to as i keep saying update the presentation of him and he could be a massive heel who knows maybe that'll turn him into the massive baby face one day that i think a lot of people think he can be so i'm really interested in this as i said this episode had a lot of what ifs as far as like progression and storyline or not what if but what's next where we 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 left thinking, what's next? What are what are they going to do next week? Like you've hooked me a little bit, you know. So I think that was the the strong point about this episode. There were there were parts that were very bad, but um, and then this started off really bad, but you know by the end of it, you're like, okay, cool, very interesting. And then they show highlights of ABC versus Cheeseball Fountain, um, the Ball of Cheese, and Trent. I will take a number seven with extra fries and a Coke, make it a Diet Coke. Um, and then they're backstage with Gia. And and when I said that the show looks better, like this is still bad, the backstage stuff. I mean, she looked like Roddy Piper at fucking WrestleMania 3 or whatever it was that he took on B- Bad News Brown and was painted half black. I mean, the shadow from fucking Cheeseball was just dominating half of her her face and body and i just don't understand why someone looks at this and says this looks good and the the marks will say who cares right it's not that big of a deal if it wasn't that big of a deal then we wouldn't we wouldn't see wwe aew and these companies doing doing it not looking like that like doing a good job of it where it looks good and professional backstage if it didn't matter then they would have poor lighting and light and, and shadows all over the place too, you know? So I just, I can't take any of her backstage segments seriously because they all look bad. At least they're not in the dark. Like they used to be in the fucking dark. Now that there's, there's light, God knows there's light there, but there's so much light that the shadow is fucking black as the fucking night. Um, Cheeseball and Trent, I'll take a number seven, should never fucking talk on screen again. Like this, I thought that they were showing a lot of personality over the last couple months, aligning themselves with Nick Nemeth, with Broken Mad. They were, they were showing some personality, but when you remove those guys from the equation and these two needed to talk to each other, that, like, this was, this was awful. Um, the interaction was just awful. Trent, I'll take a number seven. His his accent sounds like someone with a fake accent trying to. They're at a casting call and they said, "Let me hear your best fucking British accent or whatever that wherever he's from." 
and they just whoop some whip something out of their ass. Like that's what he sounds like talking. And then Mike Bailey cannot talk. We we know this. So this was just this was I thought this was like a really bad backstage segment, even though it was very minor in the episode. Very very small thing, but they're going to be fighting each other next week. Um, I I think that Trent should win because I think that's a better impact plus match. And then you um, can do something with the ball of cheese for fucking slam anniversary like that. That's the smart thing to do because I've mentioned many times they go too hard on these monthly specials. Now you want it to be good. You don't want it to be like bullshit because you want people to watch it. But sometimes they just go so hard. Uh, the one that happened after Hard to Kill, I don't even remember what it was, was so good that they could they you could tell they were like, well, who? What are we gonna do for Rebellion right now? And that's why like Rebellion, even the hardest of hardcore fans, was like I don't really like this card. You know, it ended up being a good show because they know how to put on good shows. But they just went so hard on the Impact Plus show, which I'm gonna I'm gonna call it Impact Plus forever. They went so hard on that that rebellion rolled around and was like, "Who's going? What are we going to do for this?" I don't want to see them make that mistake with Ali because, you know, Ali versus Cheeseball could be one of the best X Division matches in years. A match with Trent can be good, so use that for your monthly special. That way, you're giving them a quality match, but then the match everyone really wants to see, we're going to see at Slam Anniversary. You feel me? Um, Frankie Kazarian took on Steve Macklin. This was really, really good between two really, really good wrestlers. I don't know if I'm understanding the feud very much. It seems like it's more of an excuse to turn Steve Macklin babyface, which I don't, I'm not really a supporter of. I don't really want to see him as a babyface, but maybe it'll work, you know? Um, if he, if he can still have like a badass demeanor, then he can work as a baby face. But if they, if they got him, he's coming down, he's slapping hands with the fans and kissing babies. I don't think that's going to work. But it looks like they're trying to go the baby face route. But this was the best part of the show. It was the best match of the show. And Steve Macklin was going to hit the crosshairs. He was going to win. And then the Rascals came down and cost Steve Macklin the match. And I don't even know why, why at this point, because didn't they leave them all alone in the ring a couple of weeks ago. Like what, why are they still fucking with him? Did he, did he do something to them after that? I, I really don't remember. This is where you can, it's a better use of highlights. Cause as of, as I always say, they start off the show with a whole bunch of fucking highlights. And I think it just makes more sense to, to cut them up and use them where it's, relevant later in the show like if they would have showed us a little bit more backstory from macklin and the rascals from the last few weeks i would have and, and macklin and kazarian i would have understood this thing whole thing a little bit better many of you are more ingrained into the the small details of the show than i well no i'm the king of small details but i mean like from storyline as far as storylines going and all that because you're more active on social media talking than I, I personally am. So maybe to so you guys, it made like perfect sense, but me, let's just say I'm just a casual fan. Like I, the story was, th it's throwing me off a little bit. I don't even know why Frankie Kazarian and Steve Macklin teamed up to begin with. I don't remember that. So I just think that would have been a better, better use of showing us some highlights than, than, you know, the slow motion highlight thing they do at the beginning of the, of the show. But the Macklin baby face turn, Appears to be coming. That's not the role I want for him, but um, it looks like they might be trying to team him up with Santana a little bit. I don't mean to form a tag team, but I just mean uh, it looks like it might be. I think they're going to do some Macklin and Santana teaming up versus Kazarian and whoever the fuck. That's that's where I think it, it it's kind of going. Um, I can see a slam anniversary match of the Rascals and and Kazarian. I don't think Myron Reed is signed. It doesn't appear that way. Uh, the two rascals and Kazarian against these two, and who kn who knows someone else. Um, and then they have the the segment with Gail Kim and Giselle Shaw, where she, I would imagine, is going to Canada, some kind of cabin out there um, where Giselle Shaw is. And this was very well produced. The acting was excellent. 
The only problem is I thought they were gonna fuck. Like this, it looks like a um a high budget porn. Just with the music and the and the and the acting and the acting was good. I, I don't mean bad porn acting, but but you know, like ugh, I'm a fucking realist. I a lot of you watch porn. I watch porn. So there's there's a difference, right, between like the high budget stuff and then like the low budget. But the high budget will actually have a little bit of a story to it, and they're that they, they got a little slow music in the background, and the acting is really good. Like that that's what this was like. That's how this came off. I thought they were gonna freaking scissor each other, um, but she Gail is trying to mentor her, and I don't think there's anything bad in that. I think Gail Kim on screen would be a very good thing at this point. And I don't know how they're going to do this, but clearly there's some kind of baby face turn. And it's funny because I get on here talking about Giselle Shaw, Giselle Shaw taking all these losses all the time. And, you know, Gail was like, it was one title match. She has lost a lot of title matches. Like this isn't Giselle has lost a lot, even though they're just focusing on that one loss. But I was just impressed with the whole story of this because even Giselle had said to her, well, you know, because because Gail tried to put herself in her shoes and Gail's like, yeah, but you've won championships. Like, it's almost like she's saying that, you know, I just she's acknowledging that she keeps losing. You know what I mean? Instead of just them just giving her a random push because they need to like they're really putting some effort into this. So um, this is really interesting. This is really interesting. I said that they needed Ash to be a home run for the division. She hasn't been. So maybe this is the home run they need. Maybe this is the home run we're going to get. Maybe this Giselle Shaw thing works. For those of you who are like not fucking transphobic and just say, hey, we're just watching the knockouts division. This this could work. You know? For those of you who sit in there and be like, oh, well, a dude is going to rep. Just shut up. And I'm not some like left wing nut I'm not a right wing nut i call shit as i see it i call it down the middle who the fuck cares we're watching it's just it's, just, it's wrestling you know a sport that does intergender and all that so oh my god there's a fucking trans girl in the knockout division like oh no we'll, you'll survive people okay i promise um what do we got after this but yeah they look like they were gonna bang each other and then the uh, another thing that was really well done was santana interview i say this every time i could do without the music or or, or just sparingly use it but santana, santana is another guy that didn't really need didn't really want to chase the big stage of wwe because um family is very important to him if you've listened to actual podcast interviews not not this this you know work interview but like shoot interviews is that schedule was pretty important to him. And those are the kind of wrestlers that you want in TNA. Someone who can be a main eventer, but needs that schedule. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, you know, like someone like Jordan Grace has no kids. What What is she tied to? You know what I mean? But someone like Santana, who I, I think he said he has a daughter, but as far as his um, his mother and all that, like very, just like very close. This is the perfect home for him. Also, he's one of those guys that you can tell he's so hungry. He's like, I want to be at the top. Like, I want to be the guy. You go to somewhere like NXT, like you're not going to be the guy. You're not going to be the guy in WWE. So these are the type of wrestlers you want on your roster because they're even able to sign him long-term. It appears, allegedly. So... Um, those are the kind of guys you want. He's going to be a massive, massive baby face for this company. This is the guy you need to take the title off moves, not Josh Alexander. Like, I really think the fans will turn if Josh Alexander wins the title off moves because there hasn't been enough character progression with him. Like, they were going a pretty good direction, but um, there's just not enough, enough character with him. At this point, He's he's very white meat. He's incredible in the ring. He wasn't a great champion, a great fighting champion. You know what I mean? But I think, I know he's the number one contender, but if they put the title on him at this point, I think that would be a huge mistake. I think Santana 
eventually being the guy to get it off moose is would be where the money is and um could really work as a as a champion but yeah these are the kind of guys you want man that got a story like his that those those are the dudes that uh that you could probably afford you know i'm sure they pay him well but i'm saying like you can probably afford um they they'll have interest in being there long term because of their story and what they want out of wrestling but as i said most people become wrestlers to go wrestle in the wwe and make as much money as possible there there's some that you can get and he's he's one of those dudes and they need to find more dudes like that and i and i do think i said this years ago when frankie kazarian came over and it hasn't been true since but i'm hoping over the next couple of years it will be true that there's going to be some departures from AEW who have that kind of talent where it's like yo we we they, they could very much be at the top in a smaller company and um AEW schedule is pretty friendly too so guys will say you know i i, I prefer that kind of schedule so there could be a boom period for signings coming in the next couple of years. I think it's very, very possible, but these are the type of dudes you want. And this was very well done between this jail, jail, Gail and Giselle and the Rosemary stuff. Very fucking well done. And then we got a uh, first class in their VIP seats scouting for gold. Shows some wrestling fans booing, which I, I had to laugh. I laughed at how serious they were, but at the same time, I would prefer people on the screen that look like they are booing rather than what they usually do, which is people smiling and booing. You know, even if you look like a fucking mark, like at least you look serious and you're actually booing what you see. You know, I think I think that's still better at the end of the day. It's hard to capture people booing on TV. Like you can capture people cheering and it looks great, but to capture capture the actual fact of disgust is very hard that's why they still show you know the girl on wwe looking all pissed that little like four or five year old girl i think it might have been at the miz or something like that they still show that you know what i mean that still makes its ways around social media because it's fine it's hard to find that genuine disgust for a wrestler in the crowd um but again i'd rather i'd rather see people look like mark's booing than uh smiling and booing because they're fucking enjoying the entertain you know the entertainment of the show you know what i'm saying um but they're scouting the championship match they're even scouting the digital media championship which the fucking toy belt because rich rich swan is probably winning that at one point or aj francis is i i, I think so it would make sense for aj francis to win it because he's been you know um been around the social media influence influencers and all that I've seen some people saying, okay, they're bringing in all these people, but it's not moving the needle. Like, it's not going to. What it's going to help is with brand recognition. And that is a very, very small part of the snowball. It's the very beginning of the snowball if you want the company to grow. You know, Tony Khan was on the NFL draft with a fucking neck brace. Millions of people watch this. Even did segments talking about it. Didn't gain a one. Didn't gain a single extra viewer the next week. I think they lost viewers. So, like when the when the TNA guys were at the Cincinnati Reds game and all that, people, oh, there, well, there should be a bump in viewership. There's not going to be. It's it's brand recognition. When when you're, you know, when you got pro athletes, when you got social media influencers youtubers tiktokers it's it's brand recognition it's strengthening the brand in the eyes of the people so that that the name tna means something when people hear it if you don't watch wrestling you don't know what tna is you may probably don't even know what AEW is but when you involve yourself with these kind of characters these kind of people who have millions of followers you're going to get that name out there and then you can build from it. But it, it is the very bottom, smallest part of the fucking snowball. You're not going to get non-wrestling fans to watch wrestling, especially when you're doing fucking Mark booking. You know, the, unless it's the Attitude Era, people are not, who don't watch wrestling are not going to tune in just for the fucking sake of it. But 
they're doing the right thing and it's given the impression that the show and the company is a bigger deal than it really is. So AJ Francis is the perfect person, even if they use Rich Swan, but one of them to be the digital media champion. And, you know, they do these segments with the TikTokers and all that shit. Like it's going to be very beneficial for the company, but in a, in a growth of the brand standpoint, like it's not going to add viewers. That's just not going to fucking happen. I promise you. The Tony Khan example is the best example out there. They didn't gain a single extra fucking viewer off that, but people were talking about AEW, and that's that's what you're trying to ultimately achieve. So this main event here was the Champions Challenge. And at first I said, this is going to be a soup sandwich. If you guys don't understand that analogy, just put soup between two slices of bread and what's going to happen, you know? Um I really thought this was going to be awful, but I was very entertained with it. I thought it was as as well laid out as you possibly could lay it out. The main reason for it was because they only allowed two people on the apron on yeah on the apron at a time, and that 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 format alone made this work. And they got some time too. It wasn't like they were just doing these quick tags and matches over real quick i mean they did a good job of having it you know mixing in chaos with actual wrestling it was not the shit show that i thought it was going to be i'm whoever laid this match out the producers or whatever i mean they deserve a real pat on the back you know they deserve a ten dollar um, starbucks gift card because this was this was great they the this concept can now work going forward. Like, hey, they can continue to do this every year and people would be into it, you know? So I give them all the props in the world for it. I thought it was very, very good. They came down to the ring. The jobbers were already in the ring. When I say the jobbers, it was Step to Lander and Spitfire. They're already in the ring. Ali comes down. Ali, it would be amazing if they could lock out, lock down Ali long term. It's not going to happen. Very likely will not happen, but it would be amazing if they could lock him down. He is one of the better parts of the show. It would be very. I was saying that you know Jake something will probably take the title off him at you know, at some point. Like maybe not. Maybe if Jake is going heel, maybe maybe they're going a different route. I don't know. Um, but he's one of the better parts of the show. The Rado kid comes down next with the joke title. The music hit, and I didn't even know who was coming out. And then I was like, oh, it's uh. The Rado kid with the prop belt. And then uh Salami Calorie Ham, the bread machine, came out next. Followed by Jordan Grace. So there's only two, I guess there's three baby faces on this team. Jordan, Rado, and Salami. And then Masha Slamovich came out by herself. And then the system comes out. Is it me or the system is those those faces they show only Brian Myers and Moose? I felt like it just kept go, going back and forth between the Brian Myers and, and Moose faces or Moose is more of a logo. And then the right, you know what? That's what it is. It's just showing all of their logos. I thought it was doing like OVE where he used to show all of them. Brian Myers logo is his face, right? And then it shows the actual Moose and then it shows ride or die, which is a fucking played out term, but um, for Alicia and Eddie. So now I, now I'm, I'm workshopping this in my head and I'm getting it. If you guys notice, Brian Myers bumped Masha on the way to the ring. Why? Why does every team on this fucking show have to have dissension? What? What? Masha and Alicia are both heels. They had a mutually beneficial. They have a mutually beneficial relationship that brought the tag team titles back to Masha. Why, why, I'm not asking her to join the system. I thought that it would elevate her stock to be involved with the system, but they're making it like they're just com- two completely fucking different. I mean, what, why can't they just get, what, what is the point? Why can't they just get along? Why, why can't they just be the tag team champions? Like they're, they're from the beginning, from when they won the titles, they made, they made it sound like it wasn't real. You know, even the announcers like, oh, Masha came out by herself. Oh, the system, they're, you know, benevolent 
they're just you know want to give her her shine let her come out by herself why 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 does everyone this company with no fucking knockouts tag teams why why does it have to be any tease of dissension at all between the two of them it seems like masha gets along with with alicia like they take the photos together and and it, it, but there's still just that that weird something lurking in there that isn't genuine. You know, you know what I'm saying? And it's so unnecessary. Maybe there's a story at the end of this that involves Killer Kelly, and we're like, oh wow, great long term booking. You know what I'm saying? But like, <clears throat> excuse me. Just you have no tag teams. You have none. Why? 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 So the announcers, and then the, you know, <coughs> excuse me. I, you know, I wrote down in my notes here, very, very weird. Yeah. After I said salami calorie ham, I completely in my notes stopped writing who was coming down. Oh, I know what it was. I threw, I, I, uh, I added Sammy in the wrong place here. <laughs> Anyway, I don't think you guys truly care about the people who come down to the fucking ring in what order. But anyway, when this match starts off, they, the announcers do a very good job of explaining the rules that only two wrestlers can be on the apron at a time. And I'm like, okay, cool. There's going to be some order in this match. I said there's going to be three refs. No company makes does a better job of making their ref look like absolute goofs right now than TNA, by the way. Um, but they got three refs. Hopefully it wasn't the guy fake selling uh, Jonathan Gresham's ink. But no less than five seconds after them saying that, a, a chaotic brawl <laughs> breaks up in the middle of the ring and everyone's just fighting each other. Right after they try to say, hey, there's going to be order in this match. But at the same time, um, they go into a commercial, so it makes it makes sense to go into the break with a brawl. And then they come back and they're wrestling one-on-one. Tom Hannafin says that Lars Fredrickson is definitely playing, paying close attention to this match and Spitfire. Okay, buddy. He, yeah, Sean Merriman's watching too. He's he's got his eye on this shit for the fucking first class. Absolutely. Um, as I said, the match was laid out very very well. The way they just did the tags, uh, the way they integrated men versus women in a way that kind of made sense. There was no, you know, there was no women climb, climbing under a guy's legs to go make the tag. The women weren't biting the guys on the ass in order, in order to get out of a situation. It wasn't silly. And uh, I didn't even go into the, into all the people this match, like broken Matt was in it. Ryan Nemeth was in it. Um, the Hollywood hunk. I was looking into Ryan Nemeth. And he's done. A, he has done a little bit of acting. I was pretty sure that he did. They're very, very minor roles, but I mean, um, he he has done some work, and it looks like he's done some. Like, I think majority of his work is kind of behind the cameras, um, and I think he's involved with a lot of podcasts in one way or another. Um, it might be from like a production standpoint, but he definitely does some shit. You know, I know Mike Gilbert doesn't like him. And he thinks he's really bad. I. I don't think he's that bad. I think he's a good guy for for TNA to get, you know. He was a part of some really weird stables in AEW where they were like thrown together, but they did, it didn't make any sense. You know, they didn't dress alike, they didn't look alike. He was just like in a part of a couple four man groups that were just just completely random. And he was dead on arrival once he got there. He he could work in TNA, you know. Um, I'm not I'm not against him him being around. It shows, you know, for these people, for my fellow delusionals uh, that, that think Anthem's got all this money, they just sign all this top talent. Like, they got money, but they, these are, you're bringing in Ryan Nemeth in the main event. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think you just have to come to realiza realization, like, these are the type of dudes they're going to sign and they're going to be main eventers. Like, which is fine. It's fine, but 
you know, like Cody versus McDonald's on Twitter saying we're, you know, TNA is getting Becky Lynch and fucking Natalia because Becky Lynch says she wants to wrestle for TNA. That's not what she said. Um, and Frank and obviously Natalia has made some teased a couple things. So Jordan Grace. There's a higher probability of Natalia wrestling Jordan Grace on WWE television than on TNA television. I can tell you fucking that. But it's not impossible that Natty might be a free agent for a little bit. It's not impossible. It's not impossible to say she might not end up in a TNA ring for a match. I guess it could happen. Um, and who? Yeah. So yeah, I, I'm sorry. I did a very bad job here of uh, listing who was in the match. But you guys watch the match, you know. But just to reiterate what I, reiterate what I was saying, they put it together very well. It was entertaining. The fans were into it. Um, and at first I said the champions have no business losing this match because they're all champions and four of them are in the same group. So I'm thinking to myself, there's, they have no business losing. And at first when I knew the result of this, I was kind of upset. But then I say, you know, when you watch the match, you're like, okay, it made sense. The way the, way the finish was laid out didn't make anyone look like a goof. They were getting the ready to hit one of their moves. You know, this system, they pull Eddie Edwards out of the ring. Brian Myers runs into the standing ovation. The right guy gets the win because Joe Hendry's very, very over right now. And I think we could be seeing a real push for him. It would be a big missed opportunity if they didn't. Uh, but, but I can see a real push for this guy coming, you know, um, He's a guy, too, that probably in the back of his head, he'd be like, man, the, the WWE stage could do wonders for what I'm trying to accomplish, but he'd be in the lower card there. You know what I mean? So this this is a TNA is a good spot for him, but at the same time, they have to do right by him. And I think we're to that point that he's he's might be main eventer, you know? I think we're getting there. He, he's very very much more over than anyone else on his team that match but he gets a standing ovation so the right guy gets the win the the finish makes sense again whoever laid out this match you know buy him a bowl of spaghetti because they earned it um and then music hits guess who the fuck it is it's pco they find a way to to put pco and everything i was so disappointed when i was previewing rebellion because i had meant to say i had meant to promise i had meant to meant to guarantee like charles barkley that PCO was going to be in the, on this show. And he sure enough was, they just, they just, you know, so anyway, this PCO thing, he comes down, he's got the black bag. And I, I kind of, I kind of laughed a little when he's pulling all the random things out of the bag. I saw a lot of people hate this on social media and people are assuming that I would hate it because I don't enjoy that much about what PCO does on screen or the way they use him, you know, like I met him is really, really nice. I just don't, I'm not a big fan of the way they use him as their like Kane, as their fucking big show, you know? Um, but I, I was interested in this because he brought the black rose out and tried to give it to Steph Delander. Cause he has a crush on her now because Steph Delander in the two random ass, I don't say random. There is a story involved, but they are PCO and con and all this shit. And they keep fighting each other. There was two instances where, Steph Delander flirted with PCO, trying to divert his attention. So there's like a little bit of a story there. Well, now PCO has a crush on her. I'm not against this. I mean, I'm not. If this means PCO is going to keep wrestling con, then I'm against it. But other than that, I'm not against it. You know, it's it's a it's a different. Even though it falls into the bad comedy category a little bit, it's a different way of using PCO. It's getting Steph Delander out of this title picture that she's been in. They're waiting for, for Matt Cardona to be cleared. And what they were doing was just having Steph Delander wrestle Jordan Grace every other week. Now you kind of give her something that she can do storyline wise that maybe she could use a storyline. It gets PCO out of that. Okay. We're just going to randomly throw PCO break glass and use PCO. And it gets Steph Delander out of this like weird title picture she's in, like I'm saying. It's it's probably character progression for the both of them that they need. And um, I don't know the old Frankenstein, like 
I would be interested in them remaking Frank Frankenstein in, in current day and age, by the way. But at the same time, I don't remember enough about it. I don't remember if he I might be confusing him with like King Kong, but I, I feel like he was in love with might have been in love with someone. I don't I don't remember, but um I don't think it's the it's the worst thing in the world to do this storyline. It's it's just very different. It's 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 gonna cut down on PCO walking around backstage and yelling people's names and the lights going out and all that shit, you know. So I'm kind of interested to see see where it goes, to be honest with you. Um, even though it is kind of some bad comedy, I thought Steph Delander's acting, I don't think it was actually comedy. It was just a little cheesy, but I thought Steph Delander's acting was pretty good. I mean, I'm, I'm, inter- I'm, I'm open to what, what this can be because I care about character progression. And that's why I use Jake something as his example all the time of someone who's like here a couple years ago and then a, fast forward a couple years and he's, he's still here and he's still the same fucking dude. You know, that's why John Cena started getting booze all the time, because the guy's character didn't progress over the years in any in any way. You know, um, that's why Roman Reigns got booze for a long time, because he was still the fucking shield character. While Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose around him were all this evolution within them. And he was just because I was watching WWE at this time, like he was just still coming out. like He was a member of the shield, you know. So sometimes you have to have you just have to progress someone's character. Good or bad, but take a chance sometimes, you know? And then I use Josh Alexander as the example as well. If someone, like, progressed the fucking character, they're doing a decent job of it, but it's at a very fucking slow pace. That was at a very slow pace with Eddie Edwards. You know, that's why people found him to be really, really bland after a while. Uh, You know, Sammy Callahan's been the same dude ever since he, he joined the company. He'll tell you that he's reinvented himself. He's not. He hasn't. It's the same... The same fucking guy that came with OBE is the same person we see on screen. He's just fatter now. That is that is the only freaking difference. Um, you know, but it's kind of like with Havoc. Like, we had to see some progression with her. With Rosemary, we did, too. Even though I was saying Rosemary's at her best when she's dark, she could not have kept that character going the entire time. If we still had Sue Young around, she wouldn't have been able to be that character the entire time. Only if you sparingly use them. You know, like Amazon, I keep, why do I keep calling her that? Abaddon and AEW, you know, for the years that I was watching, she wrestled once every like six months. That character, you can't put it on screen every week, but you can put it on every six months and it works. So you could, you know, if you, if you wanted to keep Rosemary dark, she just would have to barely appear. Same with like the Sue Young stuff. But because you choose to keep them on screen, there has to be some kind of progression. And sometimes it's a bad progression. Sometimes it's a regression. Sometimes it's going backwards. Like it took Rosemary doing bad comedy and being Courtney Rush to get back to where she is now. You know, so um, if it means that PCO is going to be around for a while and they, they got to go a weird route with him, then fucking so be it. Maybe that builds him back into something that um, can be a real contender for a championship. Like he won the Ring, Ring, of, Ring of Honor world champion, their world title, world championship. And if Steph Lander is going to be around for a while, you know, we need to see something out of her too. I don't think pairing her with Khan is the is the fucking um, answer. I think they were trying to do a long term feud with uh, Matt Cardona and PCO. It just happens Khan is the dude that you know falls into that category. I wish there was someone else they could have used. I guess Khan just made sense though. You know, Khan probably was Khan had to have been leaving after those matches with PCO. I think they were just like, hey, we got a story for you. They made it work, you know. This was a much longer review for me. Um, as I said, I, I not my favorite episode, but it did have it did progress a lot storyline wise. There was just there were there was in the middle of this show was so bad, and it started off bad too. Um, but if you were someone who like stayed to the very end, I think there was a payoff for you. So that'll do it for me. This is your impact lounge. TNA Impact Review. I am your boy, BQ. We will talk soon. Peace.